I am Carson and I'm presenting a stained glass window. So Carson, uh, when was your stained glass window made? Uh, 1563. 1563? Great. And do you know who made it or where it was made? Uh, it was made in Europe by a king. Um, so was it in a castle then, or in a cathedral? A castle. A castle. Okay. And who found this window so beautifully preserved? Uh, Catherine Ellis. Catherine Ellis. Uh, was she an archaeologist? A scientist. A scientist. Okay. And um, where is it currently being held? Uh, the Viking Memorial Museum. Viking Memorial Museum. Why? Why is it at a Viking Museum? Because uh, the Vikings stole it from uh, a castle called Castle Daily. Okay, so a Viking actually stole it and didn't smash it. That makes it pretty rare then, right? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And how, um, so did, did they let you borrow it for our museum then? Is that how you ended up with it? Yeah. Yes. I'm Trinity Ryan, and I'm presenting a medieval apothecary. And um, when when would this uh, variety of medicines and poisons have been used? Well, all through the Middle Ages. All through the Middle Ages, okay. And where did you find this one? Any of these? Well, you, did you find these um, at different times, or was this a collection that you found somewhere, or that was found somewhere? They were found at different times. At different times. Where about were they found? Well, these cards say, like this one's... It says that it was native in Europe, North Africa, and Western Asia. And so which ones of these were medicines and which ones were poisons? Well, the poisons can also be used as medicines, well, some of them, okay. but most of them can use, be used as medicines, and this is a medicine. Okay. What's that one called? It's called Dracaena Draco, and it's like, it's from a tree, and it's the leaves and the bark inside, it's like blood, and they mixed it with animal blood to give the patients iron. Okay. What was it treat, you, what did it treat? Well, it could treat ulcers and like, yeah, it can actually treat a lot of stuff. Like, it can prevent you from getting cancer, and open wounds, stuff like that. And what about arsenic? Can you tell me about arsenic? Well, arsenic is also called the gift of the Borgia. Mm -hmm. And it's called that because there's this pope, and then there's a son named Caesar, and they invited people over to their house, and their last name was Borgia. And they used, ar like, they're wealthy people, and they used arsenic to poison them, because it was rude to not go to their house. <laughs> and they poisoned them and then took all of their stuff. And what about this wolf spain that I'm seeing? What, what do we do with wolf spain? What was that used for? Well, it can uh, reduce fever and pneumonia and croup and stuff like asthma and well, yeah, a lot of other stuff. Which was your favorite one to learn about? Um, probably the Vikings. Vikings. Yeah. Okay. And what about this one? Arsenic. Yeah. Also, uh, arsenic it, uh, re removes melts some severities. Okay. Oh, and cinnamon. Um. It's actually used as a medicine, uh, so it's anti-inflammatory. And the only toxicity thing about it is if you get an allergic reaction, which would be very unfortunate. What, what would happen with that? You just get an allergic reaction like people do today. People would what? You just get an allergic reaction like people do today. Oh, well, thank you very much. This is fantastic. You're welcome. Your bottles are beautiful. So that's it. I am Ossian Malone and I am presenting a trebuchet. And Ossian, when were trebuchets used? Um, in the 4th century. In the 4th century, and who used them? Um, China. China. What did they use them for? Uh, what was the purpose of a trebuchet? What would it do? Attacking enemies. Attacking enemies? Okay. So I see we have a castle here, so would this, um, knock down castle walls mm -hmm. and how did it do that launching giant rocks launching giant rocks okay can you show me on your model where a giant rock would be placed
My name is Hayden Warren and I'm presenting Medieval Stocks. And Hayden, what were these used for? Um, these were used, were used for public humiliation. And so if you robbed a, or if you did a crime, that you would uh, get put in these stocks for public humiliation. And sometimes you could be here for hours, days. It was mostly used for humiliation, but sometimes you could die okay. because of heat or uh, cold. Okay. And can we see how they work? Um, so there'd be, there'd be a lock okay. right here. And if you lift it up, you put your wrist right here, and then your neck right here. Ugh. Okay. You find them, put it down on you. You gotta push. I don't want to. Okay. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and about what time period were these used? Um, about uh, 1300s. 1300s. So I could come up and bop you on the head and you can't do anything about it? People would throw... Would they throw food and stuff? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you feel humiliated right now? <laughs> 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 My name is Eli Warren and I am presenting a, an executioner sword which is commonly used to cut off people's heads. And Eli, about what time period was this used? Um, during the 1500s. During the 1500s? Okay. And um, can you tell me how they would have somebody hold still in order to do this? Um, they probably, I don't really know, but they probably like bind their hands and legs to the ground. And they all like, use the stocks, so they're just, they're flat. So they would use the stocks? Mm -hmm. Um, and where did you find this one? Um, the sword. Or what's the story behind your sword? My great-great-grandfather's children found it on the beach in Germany. Wow, that's a pretty cool beach find. And so it's been passed down in the family? Mm -hmm. All right. Excellent. Have you thought about putting it in a museum? No. <laughs> Have you, um, why is the, what is, why is it built with that uh, flat edge rather than a point? We at least made it with you. Banged it because you wouldn't stab people with it. You just slice the head up so you didn't need a point. Hi, I'm Skyla Stokes and I'm presenting the wafering iron. Uh, the wafering iron is was commonly used in the Middle Ages, even though it originated from ancient Greece where they used two flat metal plates to make flatbread. Um, in medieval times, they kind of made it more unique by adding unique designs on it. And they were used to make wafers um, for communion, for festivals, for weddings, and for baptisms. And um, <coughs> The uh, wafering iron was thought to be originated in Umbria, Italy. Where is that? Um, right there. So this is a this was my family heirloom. My great 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 grandmother um, got it on her wedding day as a present. Her friend found it in a ruin of a rich person's house before, um, in the earthquake of 1348, and he grabbed it. And he gave it to her as a wedding present, and it's been passed down to me, and I'm sharing it with you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Colleen Avrio, and I will be presenting a Queen's bracelet from the era of Henry V. We were digging for days to find some treasure in London, England. Hours turned into days, which turned into weeks, and then turned into months. We were all losing hope as it started to get darker and darker, when I felt something against my shovel in the dirt. I figured it was a rock because I couldn't see, so I grabbed out my flashlight to take a look. I saw something that definitely did not look like a rock. It had a gold shimmer to it, so I kept digging until I found a bracelet. I told everyone about the great news. We researched the style and found it was from about 1421. We determined that it was definitely for someone belonging to royalty. It was big enough to wrap itself around an average sized book. One of my teammates immediately searched up monarchs from the 1420s. The monarch during this time was Henry V, but with a closer look at the bracelet, 
which was made out of gold with red and blue gems on it and very intricate carvings, we found it was too dainty for a man. So we searched up the spouse of Henry V and found Catherine of Valois with further research. It was given to her as a gift at her coronation from her husband, Henry V. She wore this on special occasions such as dances, holidays, feasts, etc. In 1421, the English were defeated by the French and Scottish at the Battle of Bagé during the Hundred Years' War. We started looking for museums who would take this bracelet in. After five months or so, we started to lose hope because either the museums had no interest, they didn't have anywhere to display, or they simply did not believe us. Suddenly, we got a call from Queen's Diamond Jubilee Gallery. They said that they would like to take it to fit in with other stuff of Catherine of Valois. About a month later, it was on display and is there now. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Kellen Garrett, fifth grade. Uh, this is my bubonic uh, plague doctor u uniform. Um, the mask. It was a bird-like, uh, in a bird-like shape, because they thought one of the reasons why the plague was spreading was because of the crows, and so they had a beak like this. The beak was hollow inside so they could put incense into the beak and light it on fire, such as cloves, lavender, and mint. They would light it on fire because uh, it would help them not be able to see, uh, I mean smell, the rotting and dead bodies. Uh, can I light it on? Sure. <laughs> We encourage fire to do that. My name is Kira Tucker and I am presenting a Viking shield. A Viking shield was a round wooden shield. It was used for defense or offense by biting the opponent's weapon or punching them. They measured between 80 centimeters to 90 centimeters in, diam in diameter, but they can be as large as 95 centimeters or as small as 70 centimeters. They, are often, they were often custom made to be the perfect size for the warrior who was going to use it. They weren't strapped to the arm, but were gripped at the hand at the center behind a boss made of iron. This allowed the angle of the shield to be changed and protected the hand. It protected the warrior's body, only leaving the head and legs exposed. Shields were usually painted red and white, but other colors were used. It was used as a makeshift stretcher to carry the wounded from battle. Nearly all Viking warrior warriors entered battle with a shield. Helmets and armor were also worn, but were very expensive. For many Viking soldiers, the shield was their only means of defense. There is a collection of 64 shields recovered from the Norwegian burial at Gokstead. Here, a ship was buried, together with a prince or king. The shields were painted with yellow and blue paint. The shields are relatively thin and would split easily when struck with arrows, axes, or swords. It is therefore thought that they were originally covered with animal skin, which, which, which shrinks slightly when it dries out, thus increasing the strength. The addition of animal skin also meant that the shields were less likely to split, and thus relatively thin pieces of wood could be used to keep their weight down. An almost complete shield was discovered at Trailboard in 2005. It is made of pine wood and has a diameter of 80 centimeters. Presumably, the shield was used when the fortress was in operation at the end of the 900s. These examples are very unusual clues due to the fact that after almost a thousand years in the ground, the shield boss is the only thing that survives. I'm Noah Quaker, and I'm going to be presenting my crow seer. And what is the story behind the crow seer? So, the sixth duke of, I, of Den, Devonshire um, inherited his father's castle, and he found it in a passageway that people didn't 
didn't go through often and he found these two found this doorway and found two important treasures which was the Lismore Crossier and the book of book of Lismore which was an account of Irish saints written in Gaelic Gaelic and um, so what was this used for this was used for monks to symbolize the curve on the top for um, pulling back the string, to symbolize pulling back the string people of the church. Um, a, a rod for um, strong support, symbolize strong support. And a point at the uh, point at the bottom to symbolize goading the reluctant. The reluctant. Mm. So did they carry this at all times or was it used for special ceremonies? Um, it was used mainly for special ceremonies and sometimes other other times and he during when he was talking to people he would always point the top hook toward the people and what he would always carry it in his left hand do you know why in the left hand and do you know the name of a specific monk who used this mm -hmm. uh, do you know about what year they would have been used or made um well it was made in um around the time 1090 to 1113 uh, is it currently in another museum that is longing this? It's change? in the museum in Ireland. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Hi, I am Lucent Sorensen and I am presenting my Crusader sword. Marcin, do you know who used this sword? Um, yes, I do. I think it, it came from King Richard. King Richard? What's King Richard? King Richard the Lionhearted. The very famous mm. King Richard the Lionhearted. And do you know about what year that would have been? Um, 1188. 1188. So he used it during the Crusades. Yes. Okay. And how did you come to find it? I came to find it while I was metal detecting near Jerusalem. I heard of the famous Crusades. And um, was anybody with you? Yes, my mom and my dad. Did you have to dig for it? Um, no. Actually, I found it in this side cave. Can you tell me a little bit more about finding it? Um, yes, it was in this cave where we you could really kind of peek through and see a sword in there. So we went back to Jerusalem, bought brought, bought some shovels and took them back to the cave and shovels it out. And is it currently on display in a museum anywhere else that is loading it, or is this your personal item now? Personal item now. Absolutely. And what is it made out of? It is made out of high carbon steel. Silver. All right. Do you have any other fun facts you would like to add to this? Um, it is 40 inches long and just the sword tip to whatever this piece is called um, is 30 inches long. Hi, I'm Kara Sommer, and I'm presenting a model of the Hohen Salzburg Fortress that is in Salzburg, Austria. And um, who built this? Um, Gebhard of first, the first of Heffelstein. Uh, and when was construction started? Um, the construction started uh, in like 180. 100, yeah, 180. Do you know when it was finished? It was finished in around like 1780. Okay, so they, they built on it for quite a long time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what was the purpose of this? Um, is the purpose is to pre protect the principality and the archbishop archbishops from hostile attacks. Okay. And it appears as though it's sitting on a mountain. What's the name of that mountain? Uh, the name of the mountain is Mount Gutzenberg. And how big is the um, actual fortress itself? Um, the actual fortress is about two football fields long and one, one football field wide. Uh, and around the time that they started construction on this, what was going on that it would have inspired them? Uh, the Chinese Battle of Langsheng Jiang. Okay. And um, do you have any other fun facts about it? Um, it was one of the most terrifying fortresses in Europe, and uh, Napoleon, he was one. Of, he was the only one who conquered it. Wow. Because uh, because all the other people who conquered it, they would just uh, see it and then just run away. <laughs> <laughs> Napoleon said, "I'll, I'll do it." <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anything else? And uh, in about 1524, uh, the has peasant war was going on and the peasants revolted and they t got a hold of a cannon so they took a chunk out of one of the pillars and it's still the chunk is still taken out today oh wow do you know about where uh, that would be on your model um the model it has changed a lot since since so, now okay so, so the, your model is of it when it was first being built uh, or um, um a little after it's being built okay perfect
Can you talk about what's in here? Um, these are the houses where the peasants and serfs would be um, sleeping and having their houses. And so then this is the top down, and, and this is where the principality and archbishops would live. The other fun fact? About the movie it was in? Oh, um, it was in the background of the sound of music. Really? Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Thank you, Karis. Uh, I'm Helena Ramirez, and I'm going to be presenting a hornpipe. And Helena, what was the hornpipe used for? Uh, it was used for like music and like others. Who, who used it? Uh, minstrels. And minstrels. And what were minstrels? Did they, so they would go and tell their stories using this hornpipe? Mm, yeah. Yes. And about when was this hornpipe built? It was, or made? It was built in the 15th century. Or okay. And what's it made out of? It's made out of wood and, uh, and a cow's horn. And is this something that you found or did somebody else find this? Um, I found it. You found it? Okay. Did you go on like a trip and find it or was it in your family or? Mm, I went on a trip and found it. Does it play good music? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do you know how to play it? No. No? <laughs> I don't know how to do musical instruments either. All right. Wonderful. Do you have any other facts that you want to add about it? Uh, some songs reminded them about like how the um, crusades like um, try to get the holy land. Oh, okay. So they would play, play this and then sing a song along with it. Mm -hmm. okay. Wonderful. And where was this used mostly? Um, it was mostly used in like Wales and. Like, and where was it found? Uh, it was found in uh, uh, Wales, United Kingdom. United Kingdom. Okay. Thank you very much. And I found these gallows in England. They were, well, in the medieval times, they were, they were used around like the Crusades and like all of, just most of the Middle Ages they were used, so. So this is a model of the ones that yes, you found? Yes, the model. Okay. I found, I, fa I actually, I found one, but then I didn't bring it today. Okay. So how did you find this? I found it like, it was like in this old ruins of a town. It was like, there was like this stone and stones and stuff around. It was covered in like half broken, so I'm guessing it was like a like a house fell on it or something. Okay. And does this model work? The yeah. Way it, Can well, you show us it doesn't it work works? from the uh, hand okay. thing there, but it, but yeah. Okay. So there. someone would pull the handle yes. and the floor would fall. Yeah, off. but mine doesn't do that. It just like you pull. That's okay. That at least shows how it works. Yes. Okay. And did they have a someone whose job it was to yeah, run the like gallows? Yeah, the executor or something. Okay. Do you know when gallows were first started? Actually, no, nobody actually knows. Nobody knows, huh? Okay. So they've been around for a long time. Yes. So much that we don't know exactly when it first started. So, oh, well, just, yeah. So, yeah. They they've been around for like a like like a pretty long time. Okay. I I, I was. Uh, yeah. Do you know when the gallows were last used, or are uh, they still yeah. being it used? Like in it was like in 1964 or something, and it's Peter Anthony Allen. Here in the like, United yeah. States? No, actually in the UK. Oh, in the UK. Okay. It was, it was, uh, we, we actually stopped using it before the UK did. Okay. Do you know if any countries currently still use them? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. It, it, I'm pretty sure that's when it stopped being used, like, altogether. Okay. And where were gallows usually at? Like uh, where were they? Were they at the castle? Were they in the no, town they're square? Just like all over. I just all over. Uh, my, uh, I found it in the town square, like the ruins of a town, but they like, could be like at the edges, even so other people could see. Okay. And do you know what kind of crimes would get you? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, pick, on the gallows. Yeah, actually, pickpocketing would would be one. Oh wow. Murder and treason. Okay, yeah. so stealing and murder both. Yeah. One end of the spectrum to the other, either one can yeah. get you on the gallows. Yeah, it's, it's surprising that, like, pickpocketing can get you on the gallows. Yes, that is surprising. All right, any other fun facts to add? Uh, oh, they once, they, there was this guy who once got, they were supposed to hang him, but then 
they they like did three things for him because like the lever one like the like the the trap door wouldn't open on each one. Oh. They once even hung a monkey because they thought it was a French spy. Oh, wow. And like washed up on shore. <laughs> all right, so they use it for all kinds of things yes. then. I, I even, I'm pretty, I'm not, I didn't read much about this part, but there was like, like, uh, they hung, they hung people, I think, I think like by their ankles, I, by the, the way, I didn't read much about that part because I was focusing more on this mm -hmm. part, but, uh, they said they, they, it showed them hung, hanging a dog and a, and a person by their ankles. I mean, I, I expected that, like, I knew that wouldn't kill them, so I expected the dog would go hungry and eat the eat the person. So oh. I'm guessing. I didn't actually read much on that. That's so very morbid. That is very morbid. But I, I like that you have a pirate hanging from there. Yeah. That's very nice. I, I, I just had him since I was No, that's here. perfect. Okay, we know a lot of pirates were hung on gallows, so yes. that works. All right, well, thank oh, you, Oliver. Yeah, on most, like, shows and stuff, they would hang it here. Mm -hmm. That, But that would only suffocate them, well, like, choke them. This would break their neck oh. if it's here. So. I did not know that. That's the very front part of the rope. Yeah, oh. if you put that like under their chin, because the pressure from their chin leaning that way and the pulling of the rope, like yeah. So it snapped yeah. there. They didn't actually know that. They just put it in random spots every time. But like the stuff they did find about the gallows, they like it. It worked better that way. Like they usually like died it pretty much instantly when they like, when they like looks found stuff so yeah all right very cool thank you oliver yes That's awesome i'm michael fusco and i'm presenting a monk's journal and michael what's written in this monk's journal the book of micah the book of micah and where did you find it? In a, the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress. Wow. Do you know how they ended up with it? Um, they found it from, like, years ago from when it was made, like... Do you know uh, where the monk who made it lived? Or Jerusalem. Where, Jerusalem. Do you know what his name was? Luke. Luke? Okay. And so he would have copied this out. Do you know about how long that would take him to do? Mm, three months. Three months. Okay. And do you know how it was preserved? Um... Like, as decoration. Oh, okay, so they used it as decoration and that ended up preserving it for mm -hmm. everyone else to enjoy. Wonderful. Would you be willing to hold that up and open it and let us see what's inside of it? Mm -hmm. And I see you have both English and Hebrew written, and that it's written in? Yeah, so I did Jerusalem. Okay. And, oh, he put the year in it too. Can you tell us what year that is? Uh, 1154 AD. 1154 AD. Okay, um, look at those pages. Those are beautiful. Now, what are the pages made out of? Um, animals skin and okay and the ink is made out of um is it the ink that's made out of plant material mm -hmm. okay so he would have used a quill pen then in order to write all of this down mm -hmm. okay. do you remember how they would um fix any mistakes that they made when they wrote uh, these start over try to scratch it out scratch it yes very cool all right and so the library of congress has let you borrow this for the museum then? Mm -hmm. That is really neat. You must have some good connections. <laughs> is the cover, what's the cover made of? Oh, uh, leather. Okay. So they use a lot of plant and animal products to make their books. Mm -hmm. All right. That is beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Mm -hmm.